、啊，各位老师、各位同学，欢迎大家呃来到今天的博物馆讲座。呃，今天的呃这个博物馆讲座是北京大学博物馆学院组织的第五场关于 AI 和历史相关的问题。这次呃除了博物馆。除了博古瑞研究院呃协助进行资助以外，我们还有协办单位，包括北京大学的国际合作部和北京大学呃极客实验室，同时还有北京大学海外传播办公室来协助呃做相关的学术交流活动。我们很高兴看到啊、呃，我们对呃关于 AI 和文理学相关的议题得到了大家的呃共识性的这种重视，然后获得了更多的呃研究机构的资助来促进这样的一项工作。那么，呃，进入今天的讲座的主题。今天我们很高兴的会邀请到，我们邀请到的主讲人是，呃，荷兰戴尔夫特大学，呃，荷兰荷兰戴尔夫特理工大学伦理与技术呃专业的教授，呃 ，Jordan Van den Hoven。So uh, later on, uh, so from now on, I will transfer into English uh, presentation. I'll briefly introduce Professor uh, Van den Hoven. Uh, be dedicated to, uh, to advancing the dialogue between ethics uh, and the field of information and communication technology. In 2009, uh, he won the World of Technology Award for Ethics as well as the National Federal of Information Processing Prize uh, for, for Information and Communication Technology uh, and, society, uh, and also Society of the Work Ethics uh, in Relevant Area. In publication, uh, including uh, two volume books uh, called Responsible for the Innovation uh, that published in 2014 and 15. And then he also has a handbook of ethics, value, and technology designs that is also published in 2014. Most recently, uh, he edited a book called uh, Design Ethics, which has a strong influence uh, upon the relevant research area. And in 2018, he's a co author of the book published by Blackwell's called uh, Evil Online. So today we are very honored to have Professor uh, Mendel Hoffman to deliver our uh, talk today. The talk, uh, the title for the talk today is called AI Ethics Design for Responsibility. So now please join me to welcome Professor uh, Mendel Hoffman to the talk. Thank you. <coughs> we'll see, yeah, so thanks for inviting me. It's uh, it's been, I've been hearing a lot about these meetings, and uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's a very, uh, very nice uh, environment, and uh, good to see so many of you here. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to see whether this is yeah, better to hold this. Um, I always feel like singing songs when I hold things like that, but it's, uh, I'm a bad singer, so I won't do that. Um, yeah, I want to talk about responsibility in AI, uh, but I also would like to, that's, a, that's an ethical topic that I would like to single out and highlight. Of course, you can talk for hours on privacy and on, on safety and security and all of these things, but I would like to draw your attention to one specific subset of ethical issues, which is uh, things to do with, uh, with responsibility. And the main takeaway message is, is that uh, as with many other values, uh, it is something that you need to design for. You cannot just sit and wait for things to happen and then expect that you will be able to answer questions about responsibility. So if you do something very complex with a lot of people over a long period of time, um, then and something goes wrong, don't expect that at the end you will be able to answer those questions in a reasonable way. You will have to blame you or you or you. You have to design responsibility at the beginning of the big project and then you will be able to answer those questions in a satisfactory way afterwards. So you have to design in, and it's coming back to the title of that book. So we think that ethics is, is something that, that is a design topic. Now for you who have a little bit of background in philosophy of science or in philosophy, uh, you see that design is not a category that is typically uh, studied or theorized on. It's usually about predicting the world, having a, an adequate description of the world, and explaining the world. But designing is also a way you can relate cognitively as a thinking subject to the outside world. You make a plan. You, make an, uh, you have an idea of how the world could be, uh, and you plan towards that. 
So I think ethics and engineering from that point of view have a lot in common because both are about a world that is not yet there, but could be there, right? The engineers are thinking from a functional perspective and the ethicists are thinking from, and society at large are thinking about how the world could be better, but not yet is better. So how can we make it better? Good, so that's a short, uh, let's see whether we can do this. Would it work? Uh, do we just have to put it on? It's on. No. Okay, good, yeah. So a couple of uh, kind of basic uh, lessons. Ethics of AI, uh, but ethics in general, uh, is about human beings. This is a very nice uh, clipping from, um, let me see whether I'm standing in your way, uh, from the Guardian and British newspaper. It says, um, the ethics of AI, it is about Dr. Frankenstein, not about the monster. <laughs> it's about us, the designers of a potential monster. We don't have to, we, we must not lose track of this idea. Responsibility and ethical questions are about us, you and me, designers, makers, producers, users of all of this, uh, and not so much about the thing that we have made. So there is this tendency now in robotics and in, especially in artificial intelligence to think, oh, it's such an intelligent thing. Uh, perhaps it's a person by itself. Perhaps we can share a little bit of the responsibility. Very dangerous idea. Um, we tried this out. Uh, in, uh, in Europe, we had, even earlier than this, we had in ancient Greece, Greece 400 years before the birth of Christ, so that's uh, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, we had a special court for artifacts. So if part of the ceiling would have fallen onto your head, you could take that part to court and you say to a judge and to um, make it guilty, right? To declare it guilty. And in, uh, we had church law in the 11th century uh, that you could take something and declare it a guilty object, a guilty thing that should be destroyed or confiscated by the church. The church got rich, of course, because they confiscated a lot of things that they declared guilty. But anyway, so this was a, a practice, and it was not an incident. It was everywhere. People thought that an object could be guilty. And I can even make it more spectacular. Across Europe, we had, we had animal trials, not just one, not hundred. We have thousands of them, ten thousands of them, as long as the middle of the 18th century. We thought that the donkey, the dog, the cat could be guilty and it could be punished, you know, it could be killed because it did something wrong. It made sense to hold the cat responsible. What do you think happened to these practices of holding objects and animals, you know, responsible for their deeds? We dropped that. We, 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 we skipped that because it didn't make sense any longer to us, right? You can, you can destroy a machine, you can get rid of a car that doesn't work, uh, you, can, you can take the, the, the animal out of the field, uh, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to, you know, to, uh, to treat it in the way we treat a colleague that has made a mistake or a friend that has something not lived up to his uh, expectation. So um, now this, of course, we have the, the, the 21st ver uh, uh, ver uh, century version of this, are these very complex machines perhaps bearers of responsibility? So this is a, a lively debate among philosophers. It's so complex, it's so complicated, there's so much like us in many respects. Uh, and we know how easily we can be tricked into uh, this. Perhaps I should, I'm standing in the way of all of these people, uh, the, you know, perhaps I should do this. Uh, is that okay or can you do that with a camera? Okay. Um, uh, how easily we can be tricked into believing that we are dealing not with a machine, but with a human being. Already in 1966, a very important uh, computer scientist from Stanford at that time, Weizenbaum, programmed a simple, a little simple program. You can do that with your friends from computer science in an afternoon, right? That responds to your, your questions and pretends to be a psychiatrist. So if you, it, it starts with a question, how do you feel today, right? And it, you say, oh, good. And it, and it says, what do you mean by good, right? And then you start, well, you know, the weather is nice. And so why is the weather important to you, right? <laughs> so it would go on. And before you know, and so um, uh, are you still seeing your parents, right? It would throw in a question like that and pick up then. And then you said, oh, well, really, uh, we have a little bit of an interesting dialogue here. Um, so not the case, of course. Um, 
And I very much agree with uh, John Searle here that he said, my car and my adding machine, or my neural net, or my deep learning system, um, understand nothing. They understand nothing. They are just not in that line of business, right? That's not what they do. Um, and often when you engage in a debate with people who have the opposite opinion, you will find this particular type of reasoning. Let's see whether you recognize that. Um, if I would be strong enough, I could lift this car. Some people, you could say, a child could say that. If, Daddy, if I would be strong enough, I could lift this car. Well, if I would be strong enough to lift this car, I could lift this car. That's what you're saying, right? <laughs> yeah. But you've, you're omitted to, to insert that into your claim, right? But that's, of course, trivially true. It has the form, if P, then P, right? And it has the same kind of status as all bachelors are unmarried. That's a tautology. You have said nothing about the real world. And then the discussion would continue with these people who are defending that. They would say, but if, if AI would have emotions, if it would be connected through sensors, uh, you know, multiple sensors to the outside world, wouldn't it then be conscious? Wouldn't it then be able to understand? If it would have property F and F2 and F3, and also, of course, F4, right? And also, if it could relate to multiple people at the same time, and five, of course, they start adding and adding these things. In short, if it would have all the relevant human properties to count as human, then it would surely be human, wouldn't it? Yes, of course. But now you have made, turned it, like here, into a tautology, a claim that is conceptually true, and you have said nothing interesting about the world, right? You've just provided a textbook definition. So, to be short, we have to be very skeptical about all of these promises. You know? and so, I was in a conference last week in Brussels, and there was a famous sociologist of science and technology, Brian Wynne, and he said, um, the, he, he talks about the political, uh, the political economy of promises. Right. We are promising self-driving cars. We are promising you know, superior neural networks in medicine. Uh, can we deliver on those promises? Are we not hijacked by a kind of an enthusiasm that lacks all evidence? So ethics is, second point is, so it's a human thing, right? And don't get distracted. Um, for the moment, we will work with the assumption that only humans are bearers of responsibility, can feel responsible, can take responsible, and can only uh, sensibly held responsible. So second point, it's about design. So if you look this, you know this by heart, right? You know all the the variants, the versions of this uh, trolley problem. Um, if you teach this uh, to an engineer, and, and there are perhaps, how many engineers are here? Are there engineers? <laughs> One engineer. Okay, good. Well, let me tell you, perhaps uh, I, she, she, uh, you can, you can uh, endorse that or subscribe to that. Engineers, it, it, from my experience, they say, this is a bad design, right? Because that person has the problem that, that he has because of the fact that he's put in that position, right? Of course, in a philosophy seminar room, you, you are, you're asked to leave because you didn't understand that this is a thought experiment and you're not supposed to tweak and temper with the thought experiment because it's, 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 it's designed to, make you a hard, to give you a hard time and to spell out all of the things that you have been assuming without knowing that you had been assuming them, right? But if you're interested in making the world a better place, then you have to look at the design history and how it came about that this person finds himself in a dilemma. The dilemma, because the engineer said, well, it's unnecessary because if we could have turned this switch into a brake at the same time, have two functionalities, you could have stopped the trolley here, right? And then you would have not had an ethical problem. So we see that philosophers are, 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 are taken hostage by a certain way of thinking about the situation, abstracting from the design history and the design agents that were acting before and as a result of which whose work they have, he has this, prob this problem. Um, so if you're designing these kind of infrastructures, if you're designing systems, computers that other people will use, you have a second order responsibility. That is the responsibility 
for your responsibility because if I design something and I give it to you you find yourself in this situation I should have taken responsibility for you to be a responsible agent right so all of the thinking about AI is okay we're we're letting uh, a, an incredible amount of smart technology loose in smart cities and in our environments everywhere will there be ubiquitous AI right so and it will create these problems safety security privacy you name it and and people are stuck with that problem in the same way this person is stuck with this dilemma because of earlier decisions that people have taken so that is something that we have to bear in mind ethics of AI is about designing for the responsibility of others among other things but it's the thing that I would like to highlight now it's also about the design of socio-technical systems um, so people now focus on algorithms. They've heard about algorithms. They say, oh, well, the algorithm is biased. You know, they, uh, it's been trained up um, on this data set. It excludes these people. It has not been trained on uh, people of, um, you know, for example, in China has been developed. It's, it doesn't apply to Western people or the other way around, right? So we have to be aware of that. Of course, that's important. But whether something adds value to society is a much bigger thing. If you think, for example, about the safety, nuclear safety, right? So are nuclear power plants safe? You could ask that. Is that a good thing to have in a society? Well, you could say, let's see whether this works. Yeah, uh, you, could, you, could, you could focus on the reactor. That's your first intuition. How thick are the concrete walls here? You know, what's the temperature of the cooling water? Uh, but of course, the training of the security guards are as important for the safety issues, right? Whether this works. As a, as, a, as a mechanism in society to produce energy are as important. The logistics supply chains that, that bring the nuclear material and, 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 and bring it away, the certification of the Geiger teller that you use, the reliability of that device, all of these things matter. So if you, if you think about is AI you know, good for society, you have to take a bigger picture. Don't focus simply on the algorithm inside. This is a much bigger question. Right? And you will have a completely wrong issue if you don't take that on board and into account. Um, good. Uh, so it's about designing complex systems. They're extremely complex. So ethics becomes, to a certain extent, also a yeah, very compla uh, complex, uh, detailed thing. So you have to look at the human elements in that. And there are always humans who are designing these systems. So the responsibility is here. Because these actors will be like the guy at the switch in the trolley problem. They are stuck with a system that someone else has designed as the architect of, right? Second order responsibility. Ethics is about systems of systems. I cannot make it more simple, right? It's also about the design of institutions, right? Um, so look at how we arrived, China's arrived to a lot of you know, lessons learned Europe has gone through all these lessons in these, uh, in these areas like food, aviation, nuclear, pharma, water, air. A lot of accidents have happened, right? Because we didn't have people who were inspecting the quality of the food or the pharmaceutical products. We didn't have standards for that. We ha didn't have organizations to do that for us. And now we are jumping into the digital society and we expect these things to be in place. It took, it took us hundreds of years to develop this in a very elaborate system of institutions that are on our behalf, checking the quality of the sandwiches, certifying the, the cafes and the restaurants and the pharmaceutical companies, right? Now we can trust. We rely on, 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 a, on, on society and we don't have to question uh, time and again. So we do this also, I'm, I'm making it more complex. So Wittgenstein said, when in doubt, uh, complicate, right? So, so it, and it's, it, it, we need to go to that level of detail. In different social spheres, we talk about AI in society. Oh, what, what are the rules for AI? What are the ethical problems for, in society? Now look how we did this in other areas. You know, we have different ships, types of ships, different demands for building them, different uh, requirements for their safety different types of insurance, different types of inspection and monitoring. So this is a ship that can, you can take down the river. But if you, if you try and, in, and transport cargo, if you want to do things like this, take it over the ocean to, to San Francisco uh, and, and with passengers or a lot of valuable cargo, you are not insured. 
you're, you, it's, you're taking the thing outside the scope it was designed for, right? So you're doing the wrong thing, you're criminally liable. And so you have to specify where are we going to use that AI? What are the norms that are uh, associated with that particular type of use? Don't answer the questions in general because you can't, right? You may be able to have one or two rules or principles that apply in general, but then it comes down to being more specific. So if you use AI in healthcare, for example, you have to say, okay, where are we using it in the hospital? Are we using it to do administrative processes or workflows or patient journeys or fundamental research or clinical trials or diagnosis, therapy, epidemiology, patient care, robotic surgery? Here you will have the highest norms, of course, of safety because you have a robot operating on your brain. Well, <laughs> you don't want that to go wrong. I administrative processes you can do in different ways, right? You can relax the standards, for example. So you see ethics and AI. So these are a couple of preliminary remarks that we have to bear in mind if you talk about ethics and the governance of this technology. Um, the problems. And, I would, and these are, of course, the problems, as I said, safety, the loss of lives. These are first concerns. Of course, is this thing safe? Will it kill people? Will we all get sick? Of course, that's the, that's the main thing that we need to worry about. Um, will it be used by people? Will it be, you know, people be excluded? Will only by five people in the world be using it and not us, right? So all of these questions need to be addressed. But for this moment, I would like to uh, focus on these specific questions that are associated with responsibility and subjectivity, right? In the following way, that AI may undermine a core concept that we have been working with in, in our societies, and that is that I can hold you responsible. I, I, if something goes wrong, I say, oh, well, we'll have a discussion, right? I say, well, actually, you, you did something wrong, sorry to point this out, but you, you, I mean, perhaps you should think about these things and in the future be better, right? And, and this is uh, taken to a legal stage, and it's, it's everywhere in society. It's a core assumption in the way we organize our societies. We have a very elaborate. And if you take that out, or you undermine that, or you corrupt it, uh, then something very, very important goes wrong. Because the discussions about accidents, safety, security, sustainability will go down the drain with that because people will just raise their hands and say, oh, well, sorry, I wasn't responsible. I, I don't know who was responsible, but it wasn't me, right? So all of these de debates about the, the things that I had on the previous list, right, uh, go, n go nowhere, right? So all of these things go nowhere if you lose that cornerstone. Now, how this made so it's a cornerstone in any normative framework, law, ethics, governance across the world, irrespective of your culture. I haven't come across any cultures that completely waive or jettison this idea of responsibility and subjectivity, where we can have a talk and say, well, actually, you should try to improve, right? Um, good. AI is undermining a conception of the human person as a free and responsible agent. Now think of how you would deny your responsibility if you were accused of doing something wrong, right? Well, you would say, you would say, oh, sorry, I didn't know. Sorry, I, I didn't know that there was still coffee in the, you know, the cup and I, I threw it away and so spilled it over you. I just didn't know. Or I didn't have any control. I mean, my hands were slippery and the cup was greasy and I dropped it and so I'm not in control. Or you could say, um, uh, sorry, um, I had no choice. I had to. Someone put a gun to my head and made me throw away the cup. I was not my choice. So, and you could say, you could say, uh, well, it wasn't me, actually. I was acting because all you were looking at me, and I, th I thought that you were expecting me to throw away the cup, so I threw away the cup. It was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was doing behaving as you expected me to do. I was not private. You, you, you were influencing me in a sense. So these four conditions, I think, are all relevant to AI, and AI may come to undermine each of these and affect these so that you will always be able to say, oh, sorry, I was using AI. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know. Sorry, I was not in control. Sorry, I had no choice. Sorry, I wasn't my good self, right? because I was using AI, right? And so we don't want that. We want the opposite. We want AI to enhance and augment and strengthen 
the individual so that you would say, oh, but we have actually made you more free. We have made you more knowledgeable. We have more control so that you will grow as a responsible agent. You are supported as such. Good. But have we done that? No, actually, look, I mean, AI has, the world was already extremely complex. We realized that at times of crisis, when we ask experts to explain what happened, they, are, they wave their hands, they don't know what happened, right? So the only way to deal with the system failures is to just pull out the plug, right? Um, uh, so it's, it's too, too complicated. So justification and, and, um, and explanation have become a huge problem. People have started to, to talk about a black box society. There is AI and machine learning everywhere and uh, we don't know how it works. We know it's extremely powerful. It will get us these results. We don't know which biases are inside. And um, so it's become a kind of alchemy, as this guy has in a nice paper uh, kind of argued. Um, machine learning become a new alchemy. Uh, it all started very promising uh, already in the 70s when everything was rule-based. The AI was still symbolic. It was just logic. Logic implemented with a lot of factual knowledge about the world and it could reason just by using you know, second order predicate logic or something like that with a lot of facts and it would derive from thousands of premises interesting conclusions. Right? So rule-based expert systems in the 70s and then we got to neural nets. We got to this because this didn't work. For, for a lot of reasons we can go into, the, into but it didn't work. And then this uh, happened, and that was extremely powerful. It helped us to arrive at very interesting results. It could detect all kinds of patterns that were as good. And now we have FDA-approved medical applications that are FDA-approved and that are used instead of doctors. So they're better at um, you know, diagnosing skin cancer uh, because it's all pattern recognition. That's ideal for these neural nets. You know, they, they are, they're outperforming doctors. <coughs> Um, so that's great. Um, uh, so there's this, this kind of stuff, input-output things, and it's a lot of statistics and maths going on. Uh, and we know only the correlation of the input and the output. And it's, it's working. It's, it's great. You can use that to distinguish, for example, blueberry muffins from your, your pet dogs. Uh, so that's great. Um, uh, you feed it a lot of pictures of those little dogs and a lot of muffins, and you tell which is which, and then you know, it finds out by itself. You present it with a new image and it will be able to say, oh, this is a muffin, right? Or this is your dog. Um, but you can also kind of produce world champions in Go. It's the same thing. It's patterns, it's looking at these very complex, uh, you know, images and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's valuing and assessing them. But it can also do this, kind of distinguish not muffins from, uh, from, uh, uh, from dogs, but uh, uh, huskies from uh, wolves. And um, uh, so, but they found out actually that um, the system, uh, we did this perfect, right? So you tell it, you to give it a thousand pictures of, uh, or hundreds of, um, of wolves and of huskies, you tell which is which, and then the system arrives at knowledge and it's incorporated in that neural net. And, um, but it, they found out that the system had only been looking at snow in the background because all the pictures of wolves had snow in the background and the huskies had green grass in the background. So it had only been looking at the wrong thing, right? It didn't learn anything about the difference between a husky and uh, a wolf, but only whether there was snow in the background. Well, we don't want that if you apply that to human beings, of course, right? What has this system been looking at? Has it been discriminating? Has it been looking at things that were completely irrelevant from a moral point of view? Of course, uh, we can only find out when things go wrong, right? And then it's too late. Um, so we have a little bit of an epistemic insecurity problem. It's a black box society. Uh, so we have problems with uh, explainability, transparency, understanding, sense-making, informed choice, all of these things. Uh, and they will affect the way we think, the way decisions we make, right? So that is hugely important. It's an epistemic technology, right? Um, and um, the European privacy law already anticipates these problems because uh, the discrimination and the bias that we that may be the result of these things we don't want and this law tries to um, deal with that and in article 22 it's an existing law in, in, in the EU, in EU then you have to be if it's used meaningful information about the logic of the process needs to be provided but also the data sets on which it was trained and you have to keep a track record on how you did it and you have to edit 
educate the data subjects. So it's a quite you know, demanding legal regime to deal with the problem I just sketched. Right? So, and companies are working on dealing with this. They try to come up with the antidote and using AI to provide the solutions to the problems that AI has created. So a lot of work is, is being done. You know, MIT is working on de-biasing software. So trying to bludgeon the system and torture the system in such a way to give up its secrets uh, so that it becomes understandable and we can use it to explain it. Uh, so for example, feature mapping. So it's trying to get out of the neural network to produce these heat maps and it, in, in, in order to recognize a train, it turns out here that it, it, the system has been looking more at the rails than at where these things are, right? So you, it gives you some information. Uh, here is the, uh, so in order to classify something as a zebra, um, then it looks, uh, for 53%, it looks at its stripes. 41% uh, it's the fact that it's horse-shaped. And then 29% at the background, it's in a savannah, or kind of African, you know. And together you have, bang, it's a zebra, right? So that's um, a lot of work, interesting work on, you know, trying to come to move beyond the statistics, which is this all statistics and mathematics, but try to f identify the causal patterns. Hugely important, of course, in medicine, where you want to administer medicine or you want to have a medical intervention in therapy because you know that what the underlying disease is, not because you have some correlations. They could be spurious. They could be an artifact of your data. Uh, so you don't want to, um, to do that. Uh, then there is work on what they call algorithmic recourse. So if you, if you are the subject or you are decided about uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of AI, right, then you should see to it that the person is able to change the harmful decision of the model through actionable input variables. Right? For example, you are admit, not admitted to Beijing University. So you, you, you took five tests, right? And you know, English and, and math and you know, a couple of other things, general knowledge, and so, and you're not admitted. So and you can resit the exams. So you want to know how the overall score was computed. So because you're good at ma math and bad in English, you put a little bit more effort during your summer holiday into your English because that's the way, the easiest way. So now you understand how, you, how it came to be that you were rejected and how you, as an individual, can use the model. Of course, you want to use this for student admissions. You don't want this, for example, in the tax office because if the tax office would make its algorithms transparent, then you could manipulate it, right? So, so you have to be careful uh, about that as well. So, yes, we have to do all of these efforts to try to make these powerful epistemic technologies understandable and transparent um, so that we can say, yes, we had the adequate knowledge of what we were doing. There is no plausible deniability. I was using the technology and therefore I didn't know what I was doing, right? So, second is control. But I'm taking off my jacket because the temperature is going up here and uh, it's, uh, it's a bit hot. Um, so the control issue, oh, but and now I have to move the microphone with it. Let me just fiddle with this for a mi minute. Uh, yeah, we'll just clip it on here. And this goes into my... So you have to cut that out later, yeah? Uh, anyway, uh, so now about the second condition. The second condition is control. You could say, oh, I was not responsible because I was using AI and I was not in control, sorry. Um, so how would that happen? Now we already know the you know, examples of the self-driving cars. Uh, so people were sitting on the back seat or they were in reading a newspaper and their the car crashed into someone or hit someone and killed someone. It's already happened. Um, and we will see much more of it because these companies are using society as a, as a lab, basically. They're pushing their products and they say, well, you, you guys find this out. You know, if there are some accidents, we'll apologize. Right? So, so this is an American way of doing things. It's the Silicon Valley method, right? So, you know, break things first and then apologize later. Right? That's, uh, we don't want that. We want, but of course, these things are autonomous. And then the question becomes, the driver could say, well, yeah, it's autonomous. It was supposed to work even without me driving or holding the wheel, right? Um, 
And we have this Boeing 737 MAX, right? Pilots trying to regain control over the, and the system not allowing, overruling, overriding. So this, the pilot could say, I was not in control. This was the software was, was just taking away my agency. It was destroying it. Um, so where's the control here, the human control? And of course, these weapon systems are now being used and they're becoming more and more autonomous. They can go around the mountain, no radio contact, and they will start to improvise by themselves. You know, they, we don't want them to drop out of the air, they just pursue in their course and hit the target. But they will have to do it without our input. So they start to improvise. They may say, oh, this is a target. Uh, oh, you like this target? Oh, you may also like that target, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the same recommender software that you find in your, when you buy books online. You like this book, you, might, you also like that book, right? Same software, same algorithm. You like this target, oh, let's hit that target as well. Right. We don't want that. We want to take responsibility and say, yes, this target is also good. It's also on our list, right? So, specially recommended for you? No, we don't think so. <laughs> um, so our quest is for meaningful human control. Can we use, like with the first condition, can we use these powerful technologies that will give us so good results in healthcare and everywhere, can we use them and be accountable or know what we're doing? Can we use them with high levels of autonomy and still be in control? Well, that is a quest. That's something that we need to design for. And this is what we're doing in Delft. We, have, uh, we are the first to come up with an, a philosophical account of meaningful human control. Because our engineers that are designing the robots need to know what are you, what are you talking about? Right? What is meaningful human control? Tell me what I, what I need to design. And this is the connection that we need to make. So that we can say, yes, we had the kind of control to make us responsible. So that I have no longer the plausible deniability of saying I wasn't in control. Freedom and choice. Right? Freedom and choice. Um, we know that we are locked up in these filter bubbles, right? We, you go to, you know, a site to look at some videos and of course it has learned from your, your preferences and it throws more of this stuff. If you're interested in soccer, you will get more soccer, right? And if you're interested in Chinese literature, you will get more Chinese literature. That's good. Uh, but, um, but before you know, you are in a very limited space. If you're interested in this kind of politics, then you get that. And we know that this has been used in the Western world, in America it has been used, and in Br uh, Britain it has been used in the elections to, to get people, um, to manipulate people basically. Um, and now we have nudging. Do people know what nudging is? Do you know what nudging is? No? Nudging is this book, this is the guy from Chicago University. He wrote this book 10 years ago already, 15 years ago, Nudge. Now every government in the world has a nudging team. It's, it's trying to put people in this direction, you know, please go all in this direction. You can still go in that direction, but I'm asking you to go in that direction. So that's a nudge. You see this elephant, mother elephant is pushing the baby elephant a little bit. It can, of course, not move, but, you know, so it's more likely that it will move. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, this happened in Cambridge Analytica. So this guy blew the whistle on what Facebook uh, did, shared the data, and help certain political parties to you know, get a president elected, and we know what the consequences of that is. Uh, and Cambridge Analytica was, this is not a nice picture, I couldn't find a nicer picture of this guy. <laughs> but uh, so he's broke, the, 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 the company is gone because of this, right? They manipulated, they used AI, big data, to get a profile of you, right? And they call that uh, oh, they call it, um, this, I will, I will explain to you how powerful that is. And they use that to manipulate voters. And therefore, the British people voted, and it's still under investigation, but it's highly likely that there was a lot of manipulation going on. Um, now, how powerful is that? That is extremely powerful. We have to understand how powerful that is in order to make the point that it is compromising and undermining our freedom of choice and therefore a, con a very important necessary condition for responsibility. Right? So if you're not free, you can say, oh, sorry, I wasn't free. I was, I was manipulated. Now look at this. You can subscribe to The Economist, right? And you can take an online subscription for $59. Or you can take a print subscription for 125 
or you can take the print and the web for 125 oh that is good deal right let's do this one I mean you're in good company when you think this you know 85 percent of the people do that right but here is another what we call a choice architecture a different menu a choice menu here underneath uh, so these are these this is you can online subscribe for 59 or you can do the print and the web for 125 and now many people say forget about the paper right I will just have the cheap one online if you could start to compare these you know you go for this if you start to compare these you go for this and this is not an accident it is not a coincidence this is you can get your PhD in studying this right so to make it to make it so manipulative that you have no choice that 90% of the people will do as you predict them to do and how do you know this because you're doing a B testing everyone is going to a site but all this if I provide you with a URL you will all see different URLs right uh, you see the same URL but different pages right so they, they're experimenting with colors backgrounds letter types etc and all of these things this has a label and so and the, and of course the what they want to achieve is to have you stay as long as possible on the site to click through to buy stuff they can measure that so they can study your behavior and of course then that's what will happen uh, and that can also be done in the political realm this Cass Sunstein said listen look look at this quote from this book why nudge it is possible that companies that provide clear simple products would do poorly in the marketplace because they are not taking advantage of people's propensity to blunder right so that's what's happening that's what they're studying they're using big data, machine learning, and psychology, advanced behavioral psychology, to manipulate people. Uh, and they do polarization. Yeah, so you have the Clinton supporters, the Trump supporters in the Twitter sphere, and you have polarized them. You know, they're fighting each other. In the middle, there is a few people who have not yet made up their mind. You have a profile of them, you study their behavior, and I know what I have to tell you in a tweet message to make you swing to this side or to that side. Right? It's a science. So where is our freedom to choose? Where is our freedom to make up our own mind? We can always say afterwards, we were immersed in an AI big data ecosystem, and we were not really free to choose. Right. So this is, uh, so advanced behavioral science plus big data plus AI is a very, very dangerous combination that needs to be handled very responsibly. So that we can say, yes, we made our choices freely and we stand by them, right? Privacy, finally. Um, you know, look at what the Google CEO said, former CEO said, we know who you are, where you have been, and more or less what you think. It's true, we have to take this very literal, very literal. You know, AI has been used to actually read your thoughts. Uh, there are neural nets that can do this, right? You are looking at this, and you are wired to an electroencephalogram, an EEG, right? And the system constructs your images, what you're looking at. It doesn't know what you're looking at, but this is what it produces. Right? It guesses that this is what you have been looking at. Well, that is remarkable. Look at, at these kind of things. Right? So this is already three years ago. You know, imagine what advanced machine learning with uh, generative adversive networks would, uh, would do. And we know, of course, from net <coughs> network science, the mathematics of networks, of, uh, of their social media, that if, you ha if I have 300 of your likes, I know who you are. I, I can predict in a better than your partner, than your wife, how you will score on a psychological test. Only 300 likes, right? And if I have, uh, what is it, um, 50, 50 likes, then I know better than a good colleague what you will do, right? So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very advanced science. And of course, he starts out saying, it's all about connecting people. Well, it's not about all connecting people, I can tell you. It's not. It's about your identity graphs. It's about the knowledge of who you hang out with, who you spend time with, what you do. Uh, and it's, it's using all kinds of very advanced 
advanced uh, network science mathematics to, uh, to squeeze all the information uh, out of that. We're talking about digital twins, to have a, a, a copy of you, right? So we have that already of ships because they, this is what is in the computer before we build the ship. Then we retain this. This is full of sensors and they send back real-time big data to this. So after 24 hours at sea, this is a, a unique model of that ship. Right? You can do that with people as well. Right? So I have a 3D copy of you. Philips and some companies are already creating not records, but 3D copies, digital doubles of you. And if you're wearing Fitbits or smart devices, uh, you know, cardio, cardio things, it will, uh, smart watches, it will send it into the model and the model will be updated with that information. Right, so that's, uh, of course, great. So uh, this is a great book, uh, The Age of Capitalism, uh, of Surveillance Capitalism, that kind of describes this in detail. That's, it's what the game that is. So doing what others expect us to do and to be becomes a little bit of a problem and it's a privacy problem in a sense so if i say well i, I acted because uh you know i was i was feeling the pressure from the outside world so we don't want that we want to say yes my choices were mine they were made because i thought this way and not because i felt pressured by someone else okay so ai should support the human person as a free and responsible agent Check, design for knowledge. Check, design for control. Check, design for freedom and choice. Check, design for privacy. That is what we need to do. I wonder how much more time we do have, because that would... Yeah, we're already... Uh, we're already... Past it's past. It's already. Okay, good. So then this will be my final, and if there, during the discussion there are more things, I have a couple of more slides to go on into detail about you know, certain aspects of the talk. So thank you very much. Yeah. I will just give a brief uh, summary. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, uh, we, 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 we,和责任或者设计和道德判断 产品会剥夺我们的控制权 判断在给你一些框架性的要求，使得你倾向于呃选择某些东西。在这个意义上，影响我们的自由和选择的这个能力或者范围。最后呢，还谈到了关于这个隐私性的问题。由于呃我们的很多呃这个信息暴露在网上
的这种被被操纵了的这样的选择，呃，使得我们仅仅是觉得我们自己有自由，而事实上丧失相关自由。最后一项就是在设计的初衷，呃，在设计的呃一开始，我们就需要考虑对隐私的保护以及对相关责任内容的一种一种啊一种重视吧。那我大概就因为刚才讲内容其实呃有将近呃这个。将近一个小时的时间吧，内容很丰富，我只有几分钟的时间来大致复述一下相关内容，希望能够对大家呃满足相关这个听众的要求。那么我们下面就进入这个讨论的环节，好吧？ Yeah, we never have to start a Q&A session, or if you want to break, no? no. Uh, wh whatever you're used to. I mean, if you if you want to. Yeah, okay, break. Break? Boom, boom. No, okay. no, no, no break. break. Okay, no break. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> So, very interesting talk. Thanks a lot. So, I'm very interested in your uh, epistemic problems, mm -hmm. more or less the problem A. Mm -hmm. So, you are saying that people are trying to make AI uh, systems more explainable. Yes. But uh, there is a counterfactual problem. Even when AI systems are explainable, mm -hmm. do we have the motivation or do we have enough time and energy to really understand them? Mm -hmm. uh, just imagine, okay, so every day we, for example, install some app on mm -hmm. your phone, mm -hmm. there will be something like, okay, <coughs> so you have to read the terms and conditions yes. before you can uh, use the app. Yes. And there is a little uh, yes. click, uh, check box saying, I have read. But you didn't. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we lie every day, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, in this term and conditions, everything was explained yes. to you clearly, yeah, yeah. and uh, according to some certain law, yeah. they can be effective in yeah. well law case or other. But we just don't read because it, it's beyond our say ability for, or or say we just don't have time, or we don't yeah. when we are facing this trade-off of mm. time and the convenience. Many people just choose. Convenience. convenience. No, I yeah, agree. So, yeah. uh, I think it's a little bit hopeless because I, I, I think, okay, so maybe in the future we need some AI system to help us. To exactly read, right. That's, to, that's to exactly right. This, uh, that's exactly right. And, uh, agreements. That's exactly but right. But then, what about this AI system which helps us yeah. to read in a second water yes. responsibility again? So, you're I, absolutely, yeah. that's absolutely, that's a very good point and that, that needs to be, but you're already providing the solution okay. yourself because. <laughs> AI, we're, we're, I mean, this is, this is where I started, is this the AI should be used to enhance all of these conditions, right? So, so it would make us more knowledgeable, more in control, more free, and, and more private, right? So then, then we would be actually be more responsible, or it would be more justified to hold us responsible because these conditions that are morally important are optimized. So we're optimizing on these, these parameters. Then you're pointing out some practical problems. Actually, then I go back to one of my first slides, and that's very important, that is we have designed institutions, right? So do we read the safety instructions when we board an airplane? Uh, do we pay attention when the flight attendants kind of demonstrate how the mask should be used? Uh, well, we don't do that. Do we check how the safety and the maintenance of the plane was done? Uh, no, we, we didn't. Did we check all the stats on uh, the safety of the airplane? Well, in the case with the Boeing 737 MAX, we may. But in all other cases, uh, we don't. Actually, we have deferred to an epistemic authority that is actually, that is trusted, right? Or that is, re that is trusted, that is reliable or trusted. That's a difference between the two. Perhaps we have time to go into that. But so this is the way we handle these things. And of course, also coming back to this slide on nudging, that very cynical remark that companies do not have a, an incentive to make it easy, right? Because why do we have to troll through 50 pages of small letters, small print? Well, that's because they don't want to make it easy for you, right? So perhaps we should talk to those companies and say, well, perhaps you should make it a little bit easier for the user to do this. And by the way, we can then think about how to do that. And then there's the institutional solution. So a combination of these will handle, I mean, uh, this is the way we handle these epistemic problems in other fields, medicine, aviation, food, uh, food safety, all of these things. We defer to trusted and reliable authorities that we have created to scrutinize these environments on our behalf. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just
just have one question about kind of the point about design for freedom and choice. Yes. Like I've heard some people say that they actually really enjoy having like a recommendation machine sure. having like what book they should buy. So I guess like is it always kind of like an ethical like uh, a negative ethical question or aspect? No, that's also a very good question. Um, but, um, you know, if I was, uh, for example, for me, it would be very nice to have a button where I could say, you know, this is the recommender mode of the system, but uh, I also want to have some critical counter, you know, voices to this. So I want the contrast, right? I want contrast. I want, I want you know, this is what the recommender system sa tells me. For example, in the weather forecasts of storms, Right. What you have typically when you're watching, especially in the United States, have dealing, been a lot of dealing with, with storms, is that they have 50 models. All of these models predict different trajectories for these. Uh, for these uh, I want to be able to choose. All right? If I decide I go to the airport in New York or not tomorrow morning, you know, I, I'm looking at all of these models and they say some of the models predict that it will hit the coast and it will just go around the airport. Or, and then I, I'm sitting, I'm listening to the news so that, that, is what, that is what you want. You want that choice. You want at least a choice either to be guided or to make your own choice, right? So if you have at a, at a higher level, at the zero level, you have that option, that is, that is already accommodating or, or uh, kind of solving this problem. I think for a presentation, um, is there an ethical problem on the property of such technologies? I mean, uh, considering that different countries in the world, they have different stages of development mm -hmm. and such technologies, they are developed mostly in developed countries. Yes. Do you think that countries that are developing or even poor people, mm -hmm. they, they can have uh, control over those technologies? Is there an ethical problem on this inequality, economic in, in mm -hmm. development inequality itself? Yeah. Or is it just a matter of technology and allowing people to make choices? considering they are in, uh, equal yeah, because yeah. they are humans. Yeah. Because humans, they vary, they vary a lot depending on where they are, where they are. backgrounds, yeah. and the countries in, yeah. in which they are inserted, right? Even regarding control and governance, uh, different places can have different political systems, and this can make total, total difference on the output of the choice and the freedom itself. Yeah. So is this an ethical problem? It is an ethical problem, but it's an ethical problem of the sort that I started out with. That is that we find ourselves in an ethical problem. You know, that's that some, some countries or some parts of the world are, are underserved uh, because, you know, the, the, the most powerful um, search engines are, uh, you know, intellectual property uh, of big companies. Um, so Google is, of course, the most uh, prominent one. Um, and they are not there to serve poor peasants in kind of uh, sub-Sahara Africa. So that, that is, the, so that's the situation we find ourselves in. So we find ourselves in a, in a problem that, that has, that we have let, we, we have let this happen basically because we were too naive for a long time to think about this as a crucial infrastructure for our societies. We thought, oh, it's just a fringe phenomenon. It's a little bit with IT and computers and the internet, let's say 20, 25 years ago. And now people start certainly realize that um, you know, this is crucial and it will affect my chances in life uh, if I don't have access to that information. So there's this divide between, you know, the global south and the global north. Um, and um, I mean, uh, in my country or in, in Europe, we had um, uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, people started to think uh, about a public school. Right. All the schools up that, to that time were private. You have to pay. Poor people couldn't pay for a school for their kids. We, they couldn't read books, so we thought about a public library. So we started to think about public infrastructures, epistemic institutions, universities, schools, libraries, in order to allow people to also have access, which we, we started to realize that, yeah, they also have a right to access that information. It's important to them. So we have to bring that to public. It's a public concern. So we have to pay for that with tax money. Right? It's, a, it's something that is, should serve us all, not only in a country, but as world citizens. So that's, that's a way to, to deal with it. Of course, that is breaking the monopoly 
of these Googles, Facebooks and, and, and Amazons of this world, which is now being discussed. It's the first time in 25 years that this is on the table. I mean, there is even a, a US president candidate that ma has made this her main thing, you know, break those monopolies. Thank you for your <coughs> lecture. And I have a question in column B. Right. Uh, when it when it comes to the control, we're always afraid that AI controls themselves. Right. So do you think there is any possibility that AI write, write codes for themselves? Yes. Or AI control themselves? And yes. if so, do you think it is one of the cases that AI gets out of control of human beings? Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I think uh, that that's also a very good point, and I think you know your first uh, your first part of your question is already true. You have auto ML, which is auto machine learning, which is you it's code can create new code, right? <coughs> and um, so and um, but the uh, the point is that human beings should oversee that. If you have an industrial process. Uh, in a factory, a corner of your factory, and it can run for you know a couple of days just by itself. Um, then you are still responsible because you're the owner of the factory. You have to make sure that things are not exploding in that corner of the factory. You have to every now and then check upon the process whether things are still going in the right direction. Uh, so yes, there may be a lot of autonomy there, but depending on the sector of society that you're talking, is it? Uh, you know, a hospital, or is it a factory, or is it a mining up in North China where there is no one there, only big machines ex excavating the ground and sifting the ground, then, then you have different standards and you can leave them alone for quite some time. You know, nothing will go wrong. But, you know, it's our responsibility. So that's, that's what I said. You had this complex system, and I had this little guy on top. You know, he, is, he should be monitoring, designing, inspecting that system where there will be a lot of autonomy. You know, so and we can allow for that autonomy, but we have to design the whole thing uh, with human control in in mind. Um, and of course, it may spin out of control, like a nuclear power plant, right? For so, if we have a we, we have a we have a, a, a how do you how do you call this a, um, blackout or no, burn down or something like that? It's it's, it's a catastrophe, and it starts to you know, to spiral out of control. Then for, for some time, human beings cannot meaningfully do anything because they have to let it burn, basically. Um, so, um, yeah, these things you don't want. Of course, also in the case of nuclear, we want at all costs to prevent these situations. We should have the same, make the same efforts here, not to let that happen. So if I, if I decide something by flipping a coin, right, um, then I use a mechanism that I know very well. It's a probabilistic mechanism, right? It randomizes my decisions. But I am responsible for deciding about your career by tossing a coin. And if, I, if you complain or other people disagree, they come to me and they say, you decided this by flipping a coin, right? And, and so I have to own that mechanism. If I have auto ML or advanced machine learning, in place to deal with some problems, I am responsible. We are responsible for introducing that level of autonomy and uncontrollability in society, and people have to come and see me for doing that. Please speak louder. A little bit louder. Uh, I've working on design philosophy recently, yeah. and I've noticed uh, IEEE have published their uh, P Zeno yes. uh, mm -hmm. project, and uh, one of the project uh, uh, interested is called a militant uh, uh, empathy, and uh, as as described, uh, I think they want to uh, build an emotional system mm. yeah, for AI. Mm. Do you think that's uh, possible? Or what do you, what do you think about this product? Um, yeah, I, 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 um, I'm very skeptical about these things in two senses. First is, is this feasible? Does it make sense? Uh, and, and three senses. And should we be doing this from a moral point of view? Uh, I think for the moment, to start with the last one, um, that is for the moment better to conceive of these systems just as artifacts. <coughs> 
perhaps I could have a, do, a little, little bit of water. <coughs> so just think of them as artifacts. Don't try to make them more human, right? So in introducing emotions, you're, tr you're, you're, you're pursuing that as a scientific goal. You should not. It should be absolutely clear that this is an artifact and this is a human being and if something goes wrong we talk to the people who produced it, designed it, thought about it, sold it, etc. Mainten did the maintenance on this uh, and, and so I'm not going to uh, blame this thing even if it's very emotionally tied to it. It adjusts its volume to my mood or something like that. I mean we could do that as a feature but not as something that will have moral implications. And there is always in these kind of debates the idea that this will have moral implications, that we are working towards something that is more human. Right? If it can actually enhance the performance of man-machine interaction, right? collaboration between <coughs> humans and robots to do a, an important task in the real world, then it's okay. For example, in Delft we are working on uh, a feature in robotic systems that tells you, the user, that you are too much relying on the system. You're, 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 you're relying more on the system actually than is warranted by the, by the, the you know, features of the system. For example, you're going to sleep in a self-driving car while it's starting to snow. Well, the system is saying, well, you're going to sleep, but under these weather conditions you should not go to sleep, right? You're relying too much. And so, it's not a matter of trust, you're relying too much. You're just uh, re withdrawing from that situation where it's that, that is not justified from a point of view of the functionality of the collaborative unit. Well, thank you, Professor Holden. Uh, is I came the conferences in these two days and found that there's a tendency that all the, the ethical professors, they are uh, human-centered. They're human-centered, yeah. Support human. How I can support them. It's a little bit of a bias that we have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> technologists, yeah. they're, they're, uh, the more advanced their technology are, the more maybe they're just some, to some extent like they're not human centered or even some, it's not like anti but it's like post-human or transhuman. It's especially for BCI, the brain computer interface. Right. Yes. <coughs> because uh, we talk about human and AI, we just uh, in a, this still have a boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, like human and the artifacts, they are still have its own autonomy. Mm -hmm. But for the BCI, we're, we're bound together. And what about our privacy and autonomy? It's very uh, difficult right. problem to, to, mm -hmm. to see what happened. Yeah. So, so yeah, I know that you're working on this kind of symbiosis between systems and kind of that have a possibly kind of a neuro uh, neuro substrate or our kind of neuro devices or you know, um, enhanced um, en enhanced cognition in human beings um, so that's all okay that's fine um, if you're doing kind of fundamental research to understand the working of the brain for example you you, you learn about how brains function malfunctions so it could work better or you kind of you know uh, looking into diseases or neurodegenerative diseases, etc. So these are all things that we can, uh, so that, that's okay. And then there is the applied research in this direction that could also be okay because it, it could lead to insights of how these advanced systems could work better, function better together with human beings, right? So that they're better attuned and aligned together. But when it gets to the third part, when it's uh, saying, okay, but now we have advanced kind of neuro systems, neuro based systems that are like human beings, um, and we're starting to hint at moral implications, then I have a problem for the reasons I have argued that, um, that it doesn't make sense to start to think in this direction. That is just, it, does, it doesn't work. To, uh, to, to think in this direction. For all other purposes, it's fine, it's fine. It's fundamental research, it is applied research uh, with good possible, good possible outcomes, so we should do that. It's academic freedom. It's, um, but, you know, um, we should be careful for the applications because there are companies, for example, I saw in China there was this experiment with, by the way, American equipment in primary schools to give kids this kind of, you know, this this, uh, this head uh, device that would um, signal you know, their level of attentiveness or attention, concentration. 
um, you know, that would show up in the color of their headband. So are you, so the parents would be looking, are you, you s studying your stuff or are you thinking about other things, right? <laughs> right? So, um, and so they stopped that because there was too much debate. It was interesting to see, I read the, daily, the, the China Daily today on this, it was just referring to the debate. It didn't produce any arguments of why that would be wrong. But I think if you turn that into a bachelor thesis, I think you have a nice, <laughs> nice, nice uh, thing to write, write upon, yeah. <laughs> Providing the arguments why that would be wrong, yeah. Thank you, Professor Holland. Um, I have a question. I just uh, read about uh, an article from Hart Lipson, who is the AI Research Center of uh, Columbia University. And he's pretty concrete that we will someday develop a, an AI that has their uh, own self-conscious. So if that does happen, um, what kind of challenges will we, uh, will we face? And I'm meeting him tomorrow, so if there's a word <laughs> you want to bring him, I can do it. <laughs> well, I mean, what does, that, what does that mean? You know, it will have its own conscience. I mean, it, these are... Uh, I'm, I'm very, and again, I'm very skeptical. I mean, it could have all of these cognitive, I mean, it could be the functional equivalent of that. So I was reminded, I, I mentioned this quote of a famous computer scientist from the Netherlands who won the Turing Award. It's not a, a small feat. The Turing Award um, in computer science. Uh, and he said, you know, the question whether these things, these advanced artifacts or AI systems can think or understand or have consciousness is as interesting as the questions can submarines swim right. so uh, can submarines swim well you can you can open you can open a uh, you know bottle of wine and have more <laughs> conversations about this and have deep philosophical and it may may be interesting to pursue those questions but um, you know it's about what what these things do in the world uh, what their functionality is, and they have, they may have a great impact on the world. So that's what we need to study from an ethical point of view. So, you know, will they be conscious? W you know, what will make us change our mind to say to move back to the to the Middle Ages and say, well, let's treat them as um, you know, as 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 subjects, as agents, as and hold them, start to hold them responsible, right? Um, of course, that is uh, that that. I cannot preclude or rule out that these things in, let's say, in 500 years' time will, will happen, but I think we're looking at these kind of things. We just ignore and are oversimplifying human beings. We're so, we're, hard, we're hardwired, we have evolved over the course of evolution. It's extremely subtle what we do. It can be emulated and simulated in, on numerous other platforms. The same kind of functionality is extremely limited extremely limited and um, uh, so there is much more that that is that is that we don't have a clue of uh, and uh, I think these claims are you know good for getting funding uh, but uh, I, th I think it's not a an interesting uh, direction to think of of course we should some people should think about these things because we know that um, these deep existential risks we have to prepare for so it's okay to think about these things but I, uh, uh, I would emphasize that we should not, let's say, um, overhype them or think, oh my gosh, this is going in this direction, you know, that's, no. So, sorry, I can't be more positive, you know, to, for my colleague, yeah. Uh, hi, Professor, I'm very interested in your uh, response for innovation field. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't get to that point, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have a question, mm -hmm. is that, um, I'm mainly from uh, the biomedical data sharing uh, institution, so uh, I wonder, uh, you have said that the, the, the responsibility is not a, a single thing, it's a whole cause. Yes. Yes. So, really related to the data sharing process, do you have any suggestions using the responsible... Uh, yeah. Well, I would, I would um, get that slide back, this, the slide of the complex uh, kind of system with software, hardware, uh, human beings, standards, laws, protocols, all of these things are the unit of design. So it's not just the algorithm, it's not just, you know, uh, 
one database. It's not a method of cleaning up the data or curating the data or the provenance of the data. All of these things matter, but they're all ingredients in a larger ecosystem of converging digital technologies and data and, and, and AI are, are part of that. So what you are looking at is, is trying to gauge and, and, and see whether that system as a whole is producing the thing that we want out of it, right? So and therefore these ingredients need to be aligned and cohere in a particular way in order to produce for society and think back of the nuclear power plant. Right, so you had all of these little kind of things, a pipe here, you know, a guy checking on this, a gauge reading, uh, giving you some output information on a process, um, the training manual for the security guards, all of these little things matter. So if you're talking about the use of big data and AI in healthcare, uh, then you have to break it down. I already showed that, 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 that list of things, you know, the healthcare system. It has all of these different things. And then it has, so you have to be really detailed. You have to decompose the ethical issue. The ethical issue confronts us like this. It hits us like a brick, like, oh, ethics, or AI in healthcare. Well, that depends. Let's, let's zoom in on a couple of these details and see how we would handle them. And then it turns out that this is not a problem, that is not a problem, that is not a problem. Together, that may be a problem. Here we have a problem that we need to look at in detail. So that's the way you need to study it. You have to decompose um, the huge problem. So people say, oh, privacy in healthcare, that's scary. Well, you know, look at the details. Yeah. So that would be my advice. And the other thing, of course, the lesson, but if you've looked into responsible innovation, you would know that an important idea there is, is that the innovation itself may be the solution to a moral problem. If you have a moral problem, you want to um, make your patients better, but you also want to respect their privacy, then so you, you may be tempted to say, well, forget about the privacy, let's focus on the health, right? And, and for um, these systems decisions, you have to say, okay, but we have to do it in a privacy respecting way. And then you have to have to look at all of those values and making it hard for yourself may trigger creativity. Because if you make it easy for yourself, it will not trigger that creativity because you've made it easy for yourself, right? You don't need to be creative. So you see a lot of innovation because you've made it hard on yourself. It's a, and, and so that's a very important ingredient on this responsible innovation. People who have a simple view of the world that don't take all of our perspectives into account, what you think is important, what you think is important, okay, let's put that on the table. Let's see whether we can think of something that makes us all happy, right? Uh, perhaps there may not be that silver bullet, but perhaps there is. If we got it, it's really important, and more people will be interested in that. So that's the way of thinking I think that that, that is, holds a great promise. Thank you for your And uh, as you just said, what we can measure at our AI is for making them, not making them more like human, but make them for human assistance. Yes. But, uh, and you just said in your previous slides, uh, we can apply them into spe specified fields. Uh, and I'm quite interested in that the household robots field because uh, some company in Ger like that Ger Japanese company they mm -hmm. make the robots more like human, human humanoids. Like yeah. Human, yeah. They touch even touch like human. Mm -hmm. So uh, imagine a situation: what if human and AI fall in love? So should we prevent this? And what if it happens? What can we do to mend for this? Yes, well, that's a hard question, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've read some, some papers on, the, on this. I, um, I have to say, well, you know, what... So people have all kinds of, you know, uh, preferences, right? So there's a broad... People are very different. And that's okay if it's not going to harm other people, you know. So it's what they call... Um, you know, consenting adults, right? So, <laughs> consenting adults, they, in the privacy of their home, they can do whatever they, you know, think is, if there's no problem for the neighbors or for anyone, so that's okay, right? Uh, so, if people fall in love with um, a robot, um, which looks like, you know, a, a human being, I, I, I don't think that is a, I, I can't see a big problem. Um, I can't see a real big problem. If it scales up, um, we have to probably think about that uh, because like Uber 
and Airbnb and these kind of you know things on paper for a couple of cases it looks like great you know but if you go to Amsterdam you know it's full with little trolleys and so and there are uber cars everywhere and they're causing a lot of problems because it scales up so if you have a couple of people who you know have a, a strange uh, kind of preference for robot uh, companies um, then that is that is okay but if 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 it would start to kind of be endemic or kind of you know proliferate then you would you would say well we have to probably look at that yeah yeah but japan is a little bit of an outlier there i think yeah <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you ask them, who is the engineer in the room, but there is no one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think the problem, if uh, if a five principles, um, I think is more important for the design and the, or engineer of the of AI. Mm -hmm. But uh, in in more modern society, we talk about the ethical problems of AI in a specific circle. But this circle doesn't include the uh, engineer and right. uh, uh, and uh, all all scientists. Mm. So I think I want to uh, ask a question: How to we uh, build a, a a conversation about uh, between the mm. scientific or the engineer about mm. uh, and the uh, philosophy of yep. science and technology yep. and ethics? Yep. So I think it's um, I think this five principles is more important for them and not for Hours to talk about. I think it's yeah. the machine how to uh, how to how to develop for ethics. That's a very good point. Actually, we discussed it before uh, our, our uh, this talk, um, and I know also there are some colleagues from other universities here who have been working on this, trying to bring those two worlds together and to involve. Um, you know the technical people also in these debates that are dealing with with ethical issues that is hugely important um, and you see everywhere across the world you see more interdisciplinary work cross-boundary work uh, because the real world problems are um, the solutions to them cannot be found in one book or in one discipline or in one journal right they always because they are real world problems you will have to use you know, social scientists, psychologists, engineers, and uh, you know, scientists, and uh, ethicists, and lawyers, and economists, right? So um, climate change, cybersecurity, gene editing, uh, data and AI, all of these issues are in involve many, many, need to involve many, many disciplines in order to arrive at sensible, intelligent, useful solutions for society. So very much true. Agree. From what? Central Party School. Central Party School. Uh, no, but but I can imagine what it would uh, mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, thank you for your lecture. And I have uh, mentioned the 2016 campaign uh, of Trump and Clinton. Yes. Campaign, yes. Yes. And uh, you mentioned that the uh, the AI uh, they have influence on the campaign, but uh, you know Clinton lost. So do you, uh, in your opinion, just your opinion. Uh, has uh, the influence of AI, uh, that's the influence of AI on those waters, at least on campaign, has been overestimated. Overestimated? Yes. yes, I think that, I mean, the jury is still out on that. There is still a lot of investigation, and actually there are, you know, there are a lot of bodies in the United States that are very close to the process and have a lot of, uh, you know, evidence of what happened precisely that it would be presumptuous or arrogant to you know as an as an outsider to claim the final word on this but uh, I think you can see from the stories and of the accounts of what happened and also of you know some some counterfactual kind of narratives you could easily see what the power of this would be right we have ourselves done um, a research uh, to Dutch national elections uh, and uh, scraped all, all the social media and looked at, at which political parties did what. And I can assure you there is no, we didn't find evidence in the Netherlands of Russian trolls, but uh, for sure some parties are using the social media and um, you know, applications of AI um, uh, to their advantage, more so than other parties. So that would be an unfair election. 
right? So we need to think about the rules for what is a fair election uh, when people, some people make use of these tools and others don't, right? Because of principle decisions or because they don't have access to the technology. So I do think that from all of these stories, these snippets, these accounts, these investigations that are going on, you can, you can, you can readily see that it has this great potential. I can buy thousand bots, right? I can make them Twitter with artificial intelligence. Twitter is send, send messages into the outside world that you know serve my cause, right? And I can actually simulate if I want the messages to come from Kazakhstan, right? I can simulate day and night rhythm there, and it's a, just a, it's a program. So I, it looks as if how many followers does Trump have? Well, I can tell you it's it's a, it's it's twenty percent of what he claims to have, right? So it's it's all it's 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 a it's a lot of fake uh, things. So and we know deep fakes, and it's only the beginning of deep fake videos, deep fake news. So I think we have a real epistemic crisis on our hands here, um, and uh, some people are making good use of it as I showed with the nudging example, there are people who are on top of things, they use it and they don't use it uh, to serve the purposes of the, the, you know, the benefit, to the benefit of the people, but to their own benefits. And I think that is something that we need to be aware of. Yes. Uh, Deep learning is becoming as a black box because, let's say, if a medical AI made as ma as many mistakes as a human AI, uh, as a human doctor, but we know why human doctors make mistakes, mm -hmm. probably because he's tired or for the lack of knowledge. But we don't know how AI doctors think. That's why we can cannot know why they make mistakes. So, is there any ethical challenges when people uh, like apply these uh, medical AI into real applications? Um, well, I think this is, as I've, I've shown in all the examples, this is, uh, you know, the, the object of a lot of study, cutting edge, very good and promising research that is being undertaken um, to, to see exactly, to tease out uh, what is exactly happening inside, to have a better understanding um, of these systems. Um, so that is, that is all in the, in, in, in the pipeline. Note that the use of making a mistake is also anthropomorphizing. You know, people make mistakes, but systems have malfunctions or they function just in accordance with, but it was unexpected to us. It's an epistemic problem for us. We didn't expect, it wouldn't predict that this machine would do this, or we, you know, we didn't have a clue, and then suddenly we're surprised by the outcomes. So there, there, it, it, it doesn't make a mistake. Systems malfunction or they function in accordance with their specifications and their programs, and you can reconstruct what happens, right? Um, and, um, uh, uh, yeah, so that's basically what I said. Mistakes are human things. <laughs> uh, due to the time limits, uh, we have to start our discussion up here. And please uh, join me again to thank Professor Brandon Hoffman for the benefit of the talk. And also, thank you for your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 同样呢，我们要预告一下，下周四同一个时间、同一地点，会有呃博古瑞的第六次讲座，讲座的题目是人工智能精准医学应用中的伦理挑战，欢迎大家呃呃感兴趣的同学，包括呃相关的这个人士